Today's teaching text comes from Matthew 20, 17 through 28. And as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Then the mothers of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with their sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, you are, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus came to them, and he said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Well, if you do have a Bible, go ahead and get to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, if we have not met before, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and if you, in case you're not aware, we were out uh, up in the mountains of Black Mountain this weekend as a family, uh, as a church family. Uh, we think that church is a family. And so uh, every year in November, we get away on what we call family vacation, and it's a ton of fun. But the problem is that, one, I teach a lot on that weekend. And then, two, I stay up way past my bedtime, which is anything past like 9 p.m. Uh, and so tonight's going to be either very very boring or very fun? Who's to say? One of the two. I've already apologized, uh, Garrison, our other pastor, telling him that the filter is low, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, go ahead and get there. Let's, let's just take a minute to pray, to silence our hearts before the Lord, to, to quiet our thoughts before him. If you uh, were away with us on the weekend, uh, maybe you're like me, and you're like, I prepared zero for tomorrow, and so you just need to take a pause and just take a minute to quiet the anxieties and worries of your heart. Whatever you need to do, let's just sit in silence for a moment with the Spirit. Lord, we do want so desperately to do the very thing we just sang. We want to set our hope on you and on your love. And it's your love which saves us. It's your love which justifies us before the Father. It's your love which renews us and regenerates us and washes us clean. And it's your love that propels us into lives where we step in, not to be served, but to serve. God, so I pray that you would speak to us tonight, shape our hearts, mold our thoughts, bend our wills into the service of you. God, make us disciples of Christ like only you can. We need you. We love you. Pray all these things in the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, <clears throat> Amen. Have you ever noticed just how truly countercultural and revolutionary the way of Jesus actually is? Just consider these contrasts with me. In a world of noise and distraction, the way of Jesus requires paying attention. In a world of endless entertainment and any show you want to binge at your fingertips, the way of Jesus is one of silence and solitude. In a world of speed and hurry, doing as much as we can with as little time as possible, the way of Jesus is patient and slow. In a world of radical, you-do-you you individualism, the way of Jesus is about a community. 
in a world of digital detachment where we would rather communicate with one another by staring down into our screens. The way of Jesus is about embodied presence. In a world obsessed with external image, what are you thinking about me? How am I coming across? How am I dressed? The way of Jesus emphasizes the inner life. In a world of casual commitments, breaking bonds whenever they don't serve us any longer, the way of Jesus is about covenant faithfulness. Jesus and culture, from all the way in ancient Rome until today in modern Charlotte, have always run against one another. There have always been ways throughout history that our spiritual enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil would pull us away from the pattern of life established by Jesus and towards the pattern of life of whatever culture we find ourselves in. And our practice today, as we continue with two more weeks in our series, is maybe the most clearly evident, at least to me, countercultural invitation of Jesus that we are going to find. In a world of power, in self-advancement and doing whatever it takes to rise to the top, the way of Jesus is about sacrificial service to others. That's our practice for this evening, serving and sacrificing. That's what we're called into as followers of Christ, a life doing what Jesus did in learning to lay down our lives in sacrificial service to those around us. So here's what I want to do. I want to work through Matthew 20 together, and then I just want to ask us some questions that I think will help us think about serving in our lives. So Matthew chapter 20, hopefully you have a Bible. We'll start in verse 17. Matthew writes, and as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside And on the way, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. Now, just to set the scene for you, we are on our way in the life of Jesus to the cross. The very next chapter of Matthew, chapter 21, is the triumphant entry into Jerusalem by Jesus on a donkey that kicks off what is known as Holy Week, the final week of Jesus' life before the crucifixion. And Jesus, in the midst of these days, for the third time in the book of Matthew, is trying to convince his disciples, I am going to die. It's this pattern that Matthew repeats where his disciples just don't seem to understand that the kingdom that he is ushering in, though one of power and glory and triumph, is not going to come about the way they think it's going to come about. He keeps trying to tell them, you don't understand, in God's kingdom economy, in the way God has designed the world to work, the way to glory is through death. He says, I'm going to be condemned by the Jewish leaders then mocked and then beaten and then crucified by the Romans. Do you understand that in the upside down kingdom of God, the way of Jesus is suffering that leads to glory? Now, based on this interaction he's about to have, probably not. Look at verse 20. And the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Now, it's important to understand that this is not a random woman in the text coming out of nowhere with a request for Jesus. This woman's name, we know from other places in Scripture, is a woman named Salome. And her two sons are James and John. And it's likely, based on other parts of the Gospels, that this is actually Jesus' aunt. So there's family ties here. There's relational history here. She's coming to Jesus, Savior of the world, as her nephew, saying, hey, will you let your cousin sit on your right hand and left in glory? Look at verse 21. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Now to understand what's happening here, this request, in kingdoms in Jesus' day, the king sat on the throne in the throne room, and there were other thrones that would kind of go out from the king's throne. And the thrones that were closer to the king were those of more prominence. So you kind of got less important in the kingdom as you kind of scattered out. Now this is not an absurd request. Here's why. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus actually promises his disciples they will sit next to him on thrones, ruling and reigning in the new heavens and the new earth. So it's not crazy for her to come and ask for thrones. It's just wild, as we're about to see, that she would ask for the places of right and left, the places of most prominence. But notice what Jesus responds with, verse 22. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. 
I love the boldness of Jesus. What do you want? You know, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Jesus, as he so often does, shifts the focus. When he's brought with a question, he shifts and often asks the individual a new question or makes a new statement to try to get to the heart of the matter. He says, Siloam, it's not about the place of providence, it's about the cup. Are you willing to drink the cup? Are you willing to suffer as I am about to suffer? I just told you everything I'm about to walk through in the coming week. Do you understand and are you willing to do the path as well? And he continues, they said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. So he says, are you willing to suffer and sacrifice like I will? And they're like, yes, of course we are, which is true. James is actually the first of the disciples to be murdered for preaching the gospel. And then later in his life, John is going to be exiled onto an island named Patmos, where he spends the rest of his day. So they do, in fact, drink the cup. They do, in fact, suffer. But the bad news for them is Jesus says, it's not my call. It's up to God the Father. I don't make that call. It's up to him. Sorry. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, the other disciples, they were indignant at the two brothers. I can't believe they would ask him for this. But Jesus called them to him and said, he brings all of them together. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Verse 28 there, if you've been around church, might fall on deaf ears a little bit, but notice the power and the incredible nature of that statement. The Son of Man, Jesus, God the Son, takes on flesh, enters into humanity, not to be served, but to serve. And in case that's not crazy enough, that serving goes all the way to where one day he gives his life as a ransom for many. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. The first are last, and the last are first. The greatest are the lowest, and the lowest are the greatest. Those who give their lives away in service and sacrifice to others are those in God's kingdom economy who he considers to be great. This is important. Notice what Jesus says. He says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So Jesus is not simply talking about action. He's talking about identity. That those who are great in the kingdom of God are not simply those who do serving acts, but actually take the posture and identity of a servant. Those who are great in the kingdom of God are those who learn with all of their being to wake up in the morning, not bent inward on themselves, but bent outward towards others. Those who are great in the kingdom of God are those who, when they show up to work and everyone else around them is stressed about the deadline and their to-do list is ever increasing, they say with Jesus, I am not here in this space to be served, but to serve. The greatest in the kingdom of God are those who come home from a long day of school or work at the office and they walk into the house and they don't say, I can't wait for my spouse to give me all the affection and attention that I need. They enter into the space after one day of work going, it's time for another day of work because I'm stepping into this space not to be served, but to serve. Those who are great in the kingdom of God, when their roommate doesn't wash the dishes like they've asked for the 15th time that week says, it's okay, I am not here to be served but to serve. Those who are great in the kingdom of God are the parent who when the kid just won't stop screaming their head off or keeps disobeying or needs the diaper changed for like the eighth time that hour says, you know what, I'm not here to be served, but to serve. It's an all-of-life identity, which is part of what makes it so countercultural because our culture has categories for acts of service. Right? You don't have to be a Christian to do some acts of service. You don't have to be a Christian to do some things for some people that you like. You don't have to be a Christian to give up a Saturday to help those who are needy. You don't have to be a Christian to step out and sacrifice a little bit in service to someone else. You can do that Christian or not. What makes the way of Jesus so countercultural is that servitude and service and sacrifice is an all-encompassing identity. And this is countercultural because the rule and law of our day is that every individual should have total autonomy. Auto meaning self and namas meaning law. You should be a law unto yourself. 
You submit to no one. You submit to nothing. You are Lord. You call the shots. No one gets in your way, right? This is the cultural current that we're swimming in. If you want to serve and sacrifice, great. And if you don't, because you don't like the person or you're not feeling it that day, that's okay too. You're a law unto yourself. Do what you want. If you want to serve, great. If you don't, great. If you want to serve them and not them, great. You're a law unto yourself. And it's not just the cultural current we swim in is not just this is what you uh, could do, but it's that this is what you should do. There's the promise in the offer of autonomy of the good life. The good life comes from revolving things around myself. The good life comes from putting myself first. Joy comes from focusing on me. Life comes from focusing on me. And what Jesus is going to make abundantly clear in the passage is that that's just not true. The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. The way of Jesus is not just about the law, it's not about the law of self, it's about the law of love. And in the kingdom of God, those who want to save their lives are those, Jesus says, actually lose them. And those who want to be great are those who should become servants. And those who go last are those who are identified as first. And those who give up their lives are the ones who find true and deepest joy in Jesus. He's inviting us not just to be willing to do some sacrificial acts or serving acts when we feel like it, but to have an all-encompassing identity. All right, so real quick, before we kind of apply this into our lives, let me just pause and try to encourage you. This is a, a strange sermon for me to try to preach, and I was wrestling with it um, for, for a while over the past couple of days leading into the weekend. Because to be honest with you, I actually think for the vast majority of our church, you guys are doing really, really well serving and sacrificing. Like genuinely, I mean, it, it is incredible as your pastor to watch the ways that you guys give of yourselves in service to the kingdom of God, both through our church and in our city. We uh, unapologetically ask a lot of people that are members here, and we don't, we don't apologize for it. We think it's part of the kingdom of God. We think it's a good thing. We think it's for your growth in Jesus. We think it's for your flourishing in Jesus. And time and time again, the vast majority of you step up to the plate. And I have stats that back that up. 90% of our church family has served at least once a month through the year of 2022. That's absurd if you compare that to any other statistic in the local church. Over half of our church body showed up last Saturday and gave up four hours of their time to love and serve our city and give out candy to kids. Over half of our church family has partnered with us on some extra Serve Charlotte event over the course of the year. And that's just the stats. I don't even have stats for the stuff that I know you guys are doing, like serving one another and caring for one another and loving one another and showing up for one another and providing for one another and sacrificing for the sake of the good of those around you. And so to be honest with you, I don't feel like right now I need to do the rest of the sermon on, hey, you should serve. You should sacrifice. I think you get that a lot. I think you know that. And at least right now, that sermon might come in like a year. We'll struggle back. We'll see. But here's what I want to do instead. Instead, I want to take Matthew 20, and I want to take Jesus' teaching that even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and I want to cross the bridge into our lives with four specific questions. And these questions are going to give some nuance and want to point out some dangers that you might experience around living a life of serving and sacrificing, because I think a lot of you are. And so the danger is, one, that some of you would feel guilt right now that you don't actually need to feel from the Holy Spirit, that you would actually, I need you instead to be encouraged. And for others of you, you might say, well, yeah, I do some stuff, so I don't really need to hear this. And I don't want either of those. I want you to just, with the Lord, sit with these four questions as kind of a serving and sacrificing audit, for lack of a better phrase. I'm not even an accountant, but we're going to go with that. So here's what I want to do. Four questions. Four questions out of the life and teachings of Jesus to just kind of help you with, man, how am I actually doing? Do I have some blind spots in serving and sacrificing? It'll make sense once I give you the questions of what I'm trying to do. All right, number one. Are you willing to serve that person? Serving and sacrificing audit number one. Are you willing to serve that person? The way of the world is to, quote, watch your circle. Watch who's in your tribe. Don't surround yourself with negativity or people who bring you down. I'll help them because they're my friend, but that person, no, I don't really want to help that person. I'm constantly shocked, and you will be too if you read the Gospels, that the fact that Jesus serves and sacrifices for basically anyone from any demographic or history or background or problem. He often stops to try to teach and instruct the religious leaders. He spends a ton of his time eating and drinking with who the scriptures call tax collectors and sinners, showing hospitality, welcoming those that society rejects. 
Jesus heals the families of both rich politicians and poor beggars. He serves a Samaritan woman who's rejected by her own town because of her relationship history. Even the Roman soldier on the night Jesus is betrayed, who who, uh, is coming to arrest Jesus, when Peter chops off his ear, Jesus is like, hold on, let me serve you, and puts it back on. Everybody gets served by Jesus. Like in the positive way, not like in the you got served way. Jesus serves everyone, which first and foremost is great news for us. Because if he serves everyone in the scriptures, how much more so will he serve us as the people of God, regardless of our background? regardless of our history, regardless of our demographic, but I think also deeply convicting, at least for me, when I think about who I am willing to serve. Because sometimes here's what can happen. We can take the posture of a servant with caveats around one specific person or one specific group of people. I'll serve. Yep, sign me up. Just like not that person. I'll show up when someone is in need. Just like not that person or like that need. So it's worth asking ourselves, who is that person? Are you willing to serve that person? Whoever is that person for you, are you willing to be a servant to them? Maybe for you, it's those of a different background than you or a different socioeconomic class or those who you feel like, well, I don't really want to help them because I'm only interested in helping those who can help themselves. Maybe for you, it's that really annoying guy in your community group. Like if anybody else in the group asks me to grab coffee and counsel them on their problems, I'm in tomorrow. But that guy, oh, please don't ask me. Maybe for you, that person is your spouse. You're eager, you're ready, man. If somebody in my group needs me, if a friend needs me, if a coworker needs me, I'm there. I'm sacrificially laying down my life. But the person who you've made a lifelong covenant with, it's like there's something inside of your heart who says, I just don't take the posture of servant towards them. Maybe for you, it's that enemy. That person who's betrayed you, backstabbed you, shamed you, slandered you. I'll serve anybody else, not that person, even though they're the one Jesus says, maybe the most I need to love and do good to. I'm not going to serve them. Or maybe you think about it this way. Maybe it's not a that person. Maybe it's, quote, just not. You're just not when it comes to serving. So you're like, I'll serve, just not with kids. Or I'll serve, just not on Saturdays. Or I'll serve, just not if it messes up my family's schedule. Or I'll serve, just not if it's like something that makes me uncomfortable. The reality is, if Jesus is our example of a servant, then the identity of a servant is meant to be a whole life posture that anybody can be blessed by. So that's the number one. Are you willing to serve that person? Second question in the serving audit, how much are you willing to suffer? How much are you willing to suffer? Look back at verse 26 with me from the passage. It says, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Now, we don't have time to get into it, but servanthood and slavehood is not nearly the same then as it is in modern history. It's wrong in both times, but it's not nearly the same. But what is the same is that it's not a position of ease. It's a position of hardship and suffering and toil and pain and work and labor. And Jesus says in the kingdom of God, that is the type of posture we are to take just like the son of man. So in other words, for Jesus, serving and sacrificing is risky. It costs him something. The first cost was even just taking on flesh, entering into humanity, entering into what we're about to celebrate in Advent, taking on flesh, uh, becoming human was a sacrifice. It was costly for Jesus. And then while he's on earth, it continues to be costly as he's harassed by religious leaders and he's confronted time and time again for who he's trying to serve and love. He ends up being betrayed, as you know, by one of his closest friends who he spends years serving. He lives a life without a home, without guaranteed provision. He wanders around preaching and healing and performing miracles from town to town, sometimes embraced by people and sometimes abandoned by thousands in a day. And his sacrificial servanthood, according to the passage, goes all the way to where he gives his life as a ransom for many in a graphic, gruesome, horrific death. In other words, Jesus is serving, has no sacrificial limit. So I wonder, and it's worth asking, does yours? Does the amount that you are willing to sacrifice in order to serve someone else have a limit? I'm willing to be this level of inconvenience. This level of sacrifice. I just want to stop right where it's like a little bit uncomfortable, but like not all of the way. Are you willing to suffer? 
What's sticky even about that question is that discerning what that line of suffering is, I think, takes wisdom and takes community and it takes the spirit because I think it changes with life and seasons and life responsibilities. I've lived through a lot of them. I've lived through single uh, with, without being married. I've lived married, no kids. I lived one kid. I'm now lived, living two kids and I've had crazy stressful jobs of like 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I've had jobs where it's like I'm struggling to reach 40 and I have all this free time on my hands. And I think with every different season you might find yourself in, the threshold for you of what is sacrificial servanthood is going to look different. And you have to use Use wisdom and discernment with the Holy Spirit and community to figure out, am I actually sacrificing or am I going up to a certain line? But here's what I know. No matter what season of life I have found myself in, I have always wanted to stop right at the point of sacrifice. Regardless of what that point was, and it changes based on the seasons, I have always wanted to stop in my sin, in my flesh, right at that point where it's like, nah, it's just too much now. I'll go up until this line. I'll go up until this point. If I can just push this one a little bit more into your life when it comes to this idea of suffering. Here's, here's kind of where I see this happening a lot, um, both in our church and in the church as a whole. I think one of the ways we get out of sacrificial servanthood is with the excuse of spiritual practices. All right, so track with me here. Don't let good spiritual practices be an excuse for not doing other good spiritual practices. Now, here's the deal. I want desperately, and you know this because we're doing a whole series on it and have done three now. I want desperately for our church to be a church that practices communion with God. I want you reading your Bible. I want you praying. I want you fasting. I want you having silence and solitude. I want you to practice the Sabbath, all of these beautiful spiritual practices. But if we are not careful, suddenly we might take a look at our lives and realize the only spiritual practices I actually do are the ones that are really easy and make me alone with God. And I don't actually do any of the other ones that make me actually give of my life for love of God and love of neighbor. Let me say it even more clearly. Practice the Sabbath. Please practice the Sabbath. If you're like, what's the first spiritual practice? Practice the Sabbath. 24 hours alone, or not alone, 24 hours to commune with God and with his people. That is a gift. But here's what happens when somebody gets really excited about the Sabbath, is they let their newfound love of Sabbath be an excuse to never have to love and serve the people of God. But here's what you find if you read the Gospels. Seven times, at least recorded, seven times Jesus is interrupted on the Sabbath to care for someone or do ministry to someone or heal someone or pray for someone or serve someone. And every single time he is willing to let his Sabbath be interrupted to serve someone else. And you know who gets mad at him for it? The religious leaders. So I think a Sabbath is a good thing. I like to practice it. I think it's helpful. Take 24 hours to rest with God and his people, but don't guard your Sabbath more than Jesus did. Because what I find in my life is ironically, sometimes in my sin, I want my Sabbath to line up where I know the serving is going to happen that weekend. Oh, you're moving on Saturday? My fault. I got a Sabbath. (laughs) Be willing to serve. Be willing to sacrifice. How much are you willing to suffer? Number three, are you serving from love or for love? Are you serving from love or for love? In other words, what's your motivation? Why are you serving the person you're serving? I love verse 28 again. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. Why? What did the scripture say? John 3, 16. For God, what? So loved the world. Why did Jesus sacrificially enter into humanity? Because of love. Because his love for us. Consider 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus came serving and sacrificing not to win our love, but to give us his. Because here's the deep truth of the scriptures. God doesn't need you. He wants you. He doesn't need you. But in his love, he is propelled to serve his people. In love, he is propelled to give of himself in service to others. Jesus doesn't serve for validation. 
right? Look at his life. He has all the validation he needs, right? John chapter 3, when he's going into the waters to get baptized, it's pre-doing any public ministry before he even steps into any public act of caring for and serving and loving anyone else in his public ministry. First, he's baptized, and God the Father declares over him at baptism, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And Jesus does all of his ministry, not for love, but out of deep love from God to him and for us. See that? So Jesus never serves for love. He always serves from love, being deeply beloved by God and then and outpouring that love to us. And some of us, and I say us because this is me, because of our wiring and personality or because of our family of origin or past trauma or whatever it may be, we run ourselves into the ground sacrificing and serving for others. And we do it because we think we have something we need to earn or achieve. We need someone to value us or validate us. But here's the reality. No matter how many sacrifices we make or how much we serve someone else, if we are doing it for love and not from love, ultimately that is actually self-seeking and self-serving. Because we're serving not to fill them up, which is the point of serving, but to fill us up. And serving for love instead of from love is not the way of Jesus. I think about Jesus, one of his most picturesque moments of serving is at the Last Supper, right? Where he gets down after supper and he takes off his outer garment and he wraps a towel around his waist and he takes the posture of what was reserved for the lowest of the low servants in the household. And he washes his disciples' poopy, crusty, muddy feet. Can you just imagine in that moment if Jesus is walking around going, will you just validate me? He's like washing their feet, like, do you love me now? Do you care about me now? Look what I'm doing for you. Do you, do you like me? Do you like me? No. No, he doesn't get down on his knees with those gross feet and go, do you love me? He serves not for love, but from love. Listen to me here. If that's you, if you find yourself serving for love instead of from, from love, let me encourage you. This is, let me tell you what the answer not, is not to that. The answer is not to stop serving. Oftentimes I'll hear people, hear people, this might be stepping on too many toes. This is unfiltered Tim. Um, Enneagram twos in the room. You guys do the Enneagram, it's like the serving person. I love that, that's really great. A lot of times folks will, what happens is they'll take the Enneagram or they'll realize like I'm a sacrificial person, that's kind of my wiring. And I love that so much. We need those people within the church. But what happens is they kind of realize in this kind of self-awareness moment that man, so much of my sacrificing and serving is to get people to love me, is to get them to approve of me and validate me and I'm spinning my wheels and I'm trying all these things just to get people to love me. And so then they think the answer is in order to solve my idolatry of approval, the answer is I should stop serving. That is not the answer. Listen, I wake up most every day stepping into my job as a pastor wanting you to like me. I just do. So feel free afterward if you want to come up and say, good job, good sermon, Tim. That would be great. That's what my idol needs. I'm just kidding. But the answer to me needing your approval and wanting to serve for your validation and for your value is not for me to stop serving. It's not for you to stop serving. The answer is for us to get with God to get on our face before Christ and to plead with him, God, I don't want to stop serving, but I also don't want to serve for love instead of from love. So what I need from you is reminders daily, every single morning, that just like you declared over Jesus, you declare over me in Christ that I am a beloved son or daughter with whom you are well pleased. Let that propel me into serving. I love Dave Harvey on this. He says this. He says, because Christ's righteousness has been transferred to me, all the time and energy I once squandered trying to be liked or praised or to achieve something to validate my existence can now not be done away with, not ignored, not removed, can now be redirected towards doing things for God's glory. I no longer live for approval. I live from approval. Really simple uh, barometer if you want to know if this is you. Are you serving from love or for love? Just ask yourself this question. How do you respond when you serve someone and they don't recognize it or appreciate it? Really easy barometer to know if you're serving from love or for love. Well, how do you do if you serve someone and they don't recognize or appreciate it? All right, last one. I've gone too long. Last one. Are you willing to serve that person? How much are you willing to suffer? Are you serving from love or for love? Number four, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Do you ever find yourself asking that question? (laughs) It's 3 a.m., and that kid is screaming their head off, and you're like, I'm supposed to be a steward of these children, but I just don't want to care for them right now. Is it worth it? 
When you get that phone call from that group member and you're like, this is going to be 30 minutes of just whatever. Is it worth it? Or when it's Wednesday at like 6.30 and you're like, I don't want to go to group, do all the group things. Is it worth it? We talked about this a lot this weekend, but I think it's worth revisiting. Man, it is so... Oh, let me say it this way. I understand the tired. Like, I, I, I get the tired. I've been asking myself that question a ton over the past years. <laughs> it's worth it. Like, I know I'm called to serve. I know I'm called to sacrifice. I know I'm called to lay down my life. I know that even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. But like, is it worth it? Does this matter in the kingdom of God? And this story I keep coming back to over and over again uh, is the story in Matthew 25, just a few uh, chapters later, if you want to turn over there. It's actually a story I shared with our board a few weeks ago during our meeting. It's, it's the parable of the talents. If you're not familiar with the parable of the talents, this is some of Jesus' last teachings, and he's trying to illustrate for his disciples the kingdom of God. And he says in this story that the kingdom of God is like a master who has three servants. And to some servant, to one servant, he gives five talents, which is just a, a unit of money. He gives him five talents, and he pulls another servant aside, and he gives him two talents, and then another, he gives one talent, and then he leaves. And he comes back, and the servants come to him, and the one he gave five talents to turned it into ten, and the, the one that had two talents turned it into four, but the last comes with just the one, and he says, I buried it. I knew you were harsh. I knew you were a, a mean master who was taking what was not yours, and so I buried it because I didn't trust your character. And he gives him the one. The master's upset, and he takes the one, and he ends up giving it to the one with ten. And, and there's this line in the story that I just can't get out of my head. So the master, who, who obviously represents God in the story, says it to both the one who turned five into ten and the one who turned two into four. And this is what he says, verse 21. says, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and so I will set you over much. And that's an incredible line. But that, that's incredible. What a heart posture would set, what, what, a, what a goal for us in our lives to be declared over by God at the end of our days. Well done, good and faithful servant. And there's the good news of the gospel that he will, all who are in Christ, he'll declare that over you. But what a thing to seek. God, would you declare that over me? When I get to the end of my day, when I get to the end of my week, when I get to the end of my month, I want him to declare over me, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over what I've given you. But there's even a better line at the end. Notice what he says. Enter into the joy of your master. As beautiful it is to have God declare over you, well done, good and faithful servant. How much more beautiful for him to say, Enter into the joy of your master. It is going to be worth it. I said it this weekend, and I'll say it again. There's joy on the other side of the sacrifice. There's God-given joy on the other side of the servant, serving. It is going to be worth it. Maybe not here, maybe not now, maybe not on this side of eternity, but one day when we stand before God and we see the big kingdom narrative that he's been writing since before time began, we will say, everything I gave up for the kingdom of God is worth it. It's worth it. As a, a British mission, missionary, we won't get into his whole backstory, but he was around in the 1800s. He was one of the kind of pioneers to, to ministry and missions in India. And he writes this poem that has this famous kind of stanza and refrain in it. As he's looking back on his life, he gave up so much wealth and so much renown. He was the world's most famous cricket player before he became a missionary. He was like the Michael Jordan of 1800s cricket. And he gives that up and he lays it all aside. And he goes on this tour around Britain trying to raise awareness for the missions he's going to do in India. And everybody keeps asking him, why are you doing it? Why are you giving up your life? Why are you moving overseas? Why are you going to India? You have a famous career and so much money. His dad had this crazy inheritance waiting for him. And he finally got so annoyed with answering the question that near the end of his life, he, wrote, he sat down and he wrote this, this poem. And the stanza that he repeats over and over and over in the poem is this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. He says, I gave up a lot, I sacrificed a lot. I moved my family over, over to India. I gave up my inheritance. I gave up fame and wealth. But here's the reality. Only one life will soon be passed. 
Only what's done for Christ will last. Enter into the joy of your master. So those are the four questions. As you go into this week to audit your life of serving and sacrificing, are you willing to serve that person? How much are you willing to suffer? Are you serving from love or for love? And is Jesus worth it? And our practice for this week is going to be to get alone with God and to let the Holy Spirit convict you around these questions, to encourage you around some of the questions. I think there's ways that you might say good answers, and there's ways that you might say convicting things that you need to repent of. But then at the end of the practice is going to be this invitation, and that invitation is to do the next right thing. I think sometimes when we think about serving and sacrificing, we can get so overwhelmed with the needs around us or all the different good we can be doing that we're um, overwhelmed into paralysis. But rather than doing that, the invitation of the practice this week is going to be, hey, what's the next right thing? Hey, what's the next thing you can step into? Maybe for you it's, hey, the next right thing is just go actually emotionally engage with your spouse. Maybe for you the next right thing is, hey, go encourage your roommate. Maybe for you, the next right thing is, hey, go show up to group. Hey, go join a group. Hey, go call that friend. Hey, go serve with that homeless shelter. Hey, go care for that coworker. Whatever the next right thing is, that's the invitation of Jesus. It's the small stuff of the kingdom of God. All right, I've been talking a lot. Here's where I want to close. Communion. You should have bread and uh, a little piece of wafer and a little uh, thing of juice on your seat. This is something we do every week as a church family where we take communion together. That was a hard land, my bad. Um, Here's where I kind of want to frame it for us. So if if you're not a Christian, we'd ask you not to take communion with us, Um, not because we don't like you or want you to feel weird. Uh, It's just because you'd be declaring that this is true about you when it's just not yet. But rather than take communion, our invitation every week is to take Christ to trust in him for the forgiveness of sins and life forever with God, to believe that he came to give his life as a ransom for your sins, that you cannot, you stand, like we just sang, you stand beneath a debt that you cannot afford. But he came to purchase your salvation. So trust in him, believe in him, turn from your sins, give your life to him. I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus after this. But for all who are in Christ, we're going to take communion because here's the reality. And here's why I love getting to end on communion every Sunday, but particularly today. Jesus never asks us as his people to go where he has not himself been. And so as we think about the invitation of serving and sacrificing, here's the reality. We sacrifice because we get to remember that Christ first sacrificed for us. He first gave himself for us. And so we don't step out in sacrifice going, what are we going to do here? We look back at the beautiful sacrifice of Jesus, which propels us in love to then serve and sacrifice like our Savior. So we're going to remember that together. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. And church, every time we eat this little wafer, we remember the body of Christ on the cross given for our sins. So church, take and eat. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, we are announcing, remembering, celebrating the Lord's death until he returns. Church, the blood of Christ is what washes you clean and makes you white as snow. So remember that, even as you take and drink. Just a moment, the band's going to come back up. We're going to sing and celebrate Jesus together. Our prayer team's going to be in the back. If you need prayer for anything that's going on in your life, from the, from the message or just from life, they'd love to pray with you and for you. Let me pray for us, and let's respond together. Lord, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for the reality that Jesus came, not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. God, I pray that you would help our hearts not grow accustomed to the reality that Christ left his throne to enter into humanity and take on flesh. I pray we would not miss that beautiful reality. I pray we would not grow cold to the beautiful reality that Christ first came serving and sacrificing for us. And that sacrifice and that serving took him all the way to the cross to sacrifice for our greatest need, to purchase our greatest need, to give us our greatest need, namely forgiveness of sins and life forever with you. 
God. And so I pray as we think about serving, as we think about sacrificing, as we think about those people that we don't want to serve and sacrifice for, that line of suffering we're just not willing to cross, the love that we're trying to earn and gain from serving, or even just the question we ask, is it all worth it? God, I pray you would bring us back to the gospel. Would you bring us back to Jesus on the cross, giving of himself for us? And would you let that propel us, not out of duty, not out of obligation, not out of must-dos, not to just make ourselves feel better in the moment, but propel us into deep joy that comes through sacrifice, through serving. God, would you encourage the hearts of those in this room who are serving and are sacrificing, who would say, I'm, I'm giving a lot. And you would say, yes, you are. God, would you encourage their hearts? Would you embolden them? Would you sustain them? Would you pers- preserve them like only you can, Lord? Would you help them not to serve at the detriment of their own soul? Would you help them not to be so busy doing for you that they forget to be with you? God, would you sustain them and hold them? God, and for those of us in the room who need conviction, who need repentance, God, would you move in our hearts as well to show us what are the ways we're not serving? What are the ways we're not sacrificing? Can you call us up and out for your kingdom? God, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're just worth it. Lord, we want joy that only comes from you. Let us be a people that seek that joy in every way in our lives, including through serving and sacrifice. We love you. We need you. Pray all these things in God's name, or in Christ's name. Amen.